I welcome you all to our Wheel of the Year mystery. On this beautiful winter evening, the time of waning of the last element, the element of fire, and together we will be seeing it off. Today, on Yule Eve, today is our sacred day, the last festivity of the mystery of the Wheel of the Year cycle, and we have come a very long way which began on in bulk. And these eight steps, we've made these eight steps together, which brought us to today's lessons. And the mystery itself, as you might already suspect, will be a sort of conclusion, a resultant, in a way. Although why sort of? It will actually be concluding and resulting, it will be the outcome of everything that you have done, understood, were able to comprehend and accomplish in relation to your own self and to the surrounding reality. Today we will get the extract of it all. Today we will get the result. And you are deserving of this result, no matter whether you have joined the mystery on Nimbolk or sometime later, and perhaps some of you amongst of us have joined today for the first time. That makes no difference, because this festivity relates to all of us. Surely, those who understand what is happening in these or other moments, they certainly get more results, they get more effects, because awareness is the key to success, an insurance of good luck. But even if people might lack a certain understanding, Sometimes, intuitively, implicitly, they felt that on this festivity, on a Yule winter eve, there is something absolutely magical that is taking place. With time, they assigned this magical feeling to the Christmas festivity, glorifying and rejoicing at the birth of their God. But for the longest time in ancient traditions, Yule and Christmas existed side by side, even simultaneously. In old families, there was even a custom to exchange visits, such as we will visit you on Yule and you will visit us on Christmas. And this tradition existed for a very long time. And if it is not being demonstratively exposed into the surrounding reality without getting pastors angry, then in general it was quite possible to coexist with it. And generally, Yule festivities are the longest celebrations of them all. Usually our mysteries last one day, two days, three days, some do last for six days, but for twelve days only Yule gives us this opportunity. So what is it that we do on Yule? In order to understand all the mysterious context of the ritual actions that take place on Yule, we shouldn't even for one minute forget that at this time, as actually on every milestone festivity of the Wheel of the Year, the borders between the worlds get very thin, and on Yule they disappear altogether. Because if there is no space, there are no borders. If there is no time, there is also no extension within the time. Everything gets nullified. Absolutely everything is nullified. And this means that in this moment the borders are not only thinning, they fall down. They fall down for everyone. Everyone is equal here. There are none who are more right, none who are less right. There are no friends and no foes. We all find ourselves in the same position. People and non-people, spirits, gods, absolutely all of them. That is why our ancient teachers told us that the mysterious meaning of you is when your god dies and you remain here in his place. This doesn't say that there is some sort of a special mission. It says that it is the only time of the year when you can put an equality sign between the two of you, as you're one in essence. And not just the essence, but in every possible relation, in physical, in mental, in manifestations and in the non-manifestations, just absolutely equal. And you can distinctly and exactly feel this connection, and not even a connection, but a likeness, an absolute and exact mirror reflection type equivalence of yourself and your God, who has departed into the darkness, but you remained here. 
And where is your light, that is where his darkness is. And where is his darkness, that is where your light is. That is the only difference between you. And even then it makes no difference because light and dark become relative. Because the paths of the light and the dark ones cross in the intertemporality and interdimensionality during the 40 days after you. The passages between the worlds, the connections with the ancients and with the future self, are defined by nature itself, by the very fabric, suddenly connected within the reality's timelessness. It is precisely due to this, for this very reason, that one could, precisely in this period, practice divination to make certain wishes related to your fate. This was customary even during Christianity, when people were allowed to perform Christmas divination, although the pastors, of course, did clench their teeth. But rules are rules, and rules are the same for everyone. And people happily use this opportunity. They parted. And rejoiced. This, of course, is an echo of Saturnalias, of the ancient Roman celebrations when, in honor of the god Saturn, people celebrated the longing for what was lost. Because it was considered that it was precisely the Saturn period, the period of god Saturn, that used to be a certain golden age, when there were no servants and no masters, when everyone was equal. During the Roman Saturnalia, it was even accustomed for masters and servants to switch roles in a playful fashion, such as masters would serve the servants, and the servants attended symposiums and other events open only to those of a higher authority. Although, of course, it was said that during those times masters closely observed their servants, judging their behavior, determining their true value. But these are all, so to say, later additions, and they have nothing to do with the mystical meaning of you. The mystical meaning lies in something else, in the fact that for the ancient, for the gods, for the gods of fate, for the world of Elysium, which according to the stories and myths is the dwelling place of Saturn, or god Kronos in Greek tradition, there is the very place where time and space do not exist. And if you happen to sense it through and through, then something similar to Elysium will also form around you. A place without time, without wars, a place without conflicts, a place without problems. You have to enter this state. And our forefathers, they tried in this playful fashion to approach this state by recreating these ritual steps. When a servant, while in costume and wearing a mask, could barge into the house of a nobleman, turn everything upside down without being punished for it, when else would that be acceptable? But that, of course, is not the only important thing. During Saturnalia, again in ancient Rome, from the 19th to 23rd of December, so it was, of course, they also used to honor their predecessors, but not the ones that we spoke about on Samhain, no, but the very ancient forefathers. In Rome, they used to call them Lars, or geniuses, the spirits of the kin, meaning that it is not actually your personal predecessor, but a certain force, a quintessence of the kin that protects the entire bloodline. It protects those who are dead and those who are living, and those who haven't been born yet. And the offerings that were given to Lars, these offerings were to the spirits of the kin, those who protect the egregor of the entire kin. The Celts used to call them Banshee, but also said that not every family had a right to have one, meaning that not every family had a Banshee, but only very ancient clans who have earned it by staying loyal to the old gods. They earned the right to have a Banshee herself as their patron spirit. Banshee is not a full name. It means a woman of the She tribe. Ban is a woman, and She is a tribe. The She tribe is a fairy tribe, or fae, as they call 
call them nowadays. Therefore, a banshee is a woman of the she family, meaning a woman who is the patron spirit of a certain kin. And this legend of the banshee connection to the ancient family clans of Scotland, for example the Welsh, it brings us to the Slavic tradition and the ancient tradition and ancient ritual rules which have been preserved to their full extent, preserved by the Slavs, preserved by the Celts. This tradition and ritual which you all know literally from childhood. It is the ritual of the gift exchange. And here I would like for you to feel this ritual a little bit differently than you're used to perceiving it from when you were little. So since there is no time nor space and we all become united and the barriers that were put in place by those who have left the folks and races who turned away from people, including the magical races, are now down. Since this barrier has fallen, we find ourselves in one spaceless space, in one timeless time. And Yule gifts on all 13 nights of Yule carried a meaning of a ritual gift exchange. These presents under the tree represent the receiving of a gift, but not from us, but to us. Eventually, of course, when we have lost the connection with our good neighbors, parents began to leave the presents under the tree for their children. But they always said that it was from someone else, that it is from Santa Claus. But who is Santa Claus actually? It is a very ancient god. In Ross, they called him Korochun. In Scandinavia, he went by several different names, but primarily has historically remained known as the Yule Goat. Actually, the Finnish name Yolupuki means the Yule Goat, although his image is Santa Claus-like, meaning a certain nimble old man in a short coat with a beard, or in a long coat, but again with a beard, in a human-like form. Originally, he was an anthropomorphic deity with horns, naturally with a beard, but was precisely animal-like, only later it became human-like. And it was considered that precisely on this day this ancient deity could get in contact with humans, and it was the only time when he agreed to accept their gifts, because such was the will of the ancient goddess. At any other time he hates humans, and there are very good reasons for it. But during this period he has no right to hate, and must fulfill this ritual, to give a gift and to accept a gift. When people decorate a tree, it is actually a ritual gesture of giving a gift. And when they in the morning take something from under the tree, that is, to receive a gift. The symbol of the tree and the presence has these very deep roots. And its echoes, of course, do still exist. And we have to know, we must know, that they come to us from great antiquity, not even from pre-Christian ages, but from such forgotten antediluvian times, when our predecessors believed in a Yule goat, this ancient god of animal form, smelly, lusty, bearded, personifying the very wild passion of nature that has been pushed further and further away by humans, together with that function of nature that intends to necessarily recreate oneself, free of any morals. And the further man got into morality, the more he pushed away this natural quality. But nature and the Norns and the ancient mothers, they insist, well, 
Good. But there must be a time when your rejection doesn't play a role any longer. Same as the rejection of the other side will not play one. You both will eventually unite in a gift exchange and will stop killing each other, stop blaming each other. On this day we bring the offerings to the spirits of places, we give gifts to the forces of our bloodlines, and we remember the true mystical meaning of gift-giving to the space surrounding us and our good neighbors, and the borders which currently don't exist between us, giving the gifts and also wholeheartedly accepting everything that they will give to us. And someone who proves his sincerity in this gift exchange doesn't go unnoticed by the great mothers. And maybe right away, or after some time, these people, and maybe that is you, will suddenly notice that their families and kins were joined by a new friend, a friend from the other side. Друг с той стороны. Лар. A lar, a genius, a banshee, or a berginia, as she was called in Rus. That same force which takes on a responsibility to protect the entire kin. And if you carry out these ritual actions in Yule, then the probability to get such a patron grows tremendously. I very much hope that you would get to sense it, to feel it, literally with every fiber of your being, with every tip of your finger, with every hair, that you possibly have a friend on the other side. And that it is solely up to you whether you get to become his friend, a friend to this force which will become the source of never-ending life. Not for an individual, but for the kin. And this will mean that the power of your family, the egregor of your kin, will greatly become stronger. If any of you have studied the Celtic tradition, the tradition of the ancient Scottish clans, then you probably know what I am talking about. If not, then we will have the time to study it together, or you will independently get interested in this subject and try to study the lives of such kins from a mystical, from an occult viewpoint. What else do I want to tell you on you? The thirteenth night for you is the night of absolute freedom for yourself. Don't forget about it. Use it to your advantage. They say that on this night the most impossible, the most extraordinary, the most incredible could come true. Even something that you couldn't dream of, even something that you were afraid to think of. But maybe precisely this year, on the 13th night, it will actually happen. 